The Sierra Nevada Mountains, sometimes called the High Sierras, is one of America's great mountain ranges, a range exclusively located in the state of California. The Sierras contain the highest point in the continental 48 states, Mount Whitney at 14,494 feet high. It is a range whose snow-capped peaks supply most of the water for California's agriculturally rich Central Valley. Snow-capped peaks that also supply much of the water for California's two great population centers, the Los Angeles Basin and the San Francisco Bay Urban Complex. However, the Sierra Nevada mountain range also contains some of the most amazing wonders found on the planet. Nowhere else is nature's awe-inspiring grandeur more deserving of lavish, oh wow, mind-blowing experiences. Yosemite Valley is one of the most jaw-droppingly beautiful places on Earth. I mean, it's got the largest exposed face of granite in El Capitan. It's got Half Dome. It's the longest waterfall in North America, in Yosemite Fall. I mean, and you just look around amazed that these things are all in one place. I mean, I, every time I go back, I've gone since I was a little kid. Probably the first time I went was I was five. But every time I've gone back since, it's brings me back to that first time I saw these features and just speechless, you can't, I mean, just the granite just explodes into the sky and uh, the waterfalls, I mean, are, are mind boggling. It's like a Californian cathedral uh, for lots of people in the Bay Area, even LA, they consider it their, their special place. Their ashes have to be dropped there, but when they die and so on. And it's, it's always surprised me that uh, so many people in California are in love with Yosemite in an almost uh, excessive way and the rest of the United States doesn't seem to know it exists except as a word. But Yosemite is an incredibly beautiful um, glacier carved system. There are a couple of big valleys there, Hetch Hetchy and Yosemite. And those two have, uh, because the granite itself is so recent, you know, maybe 10 million years old, the, all the carving that's been done has been done in, ex, in an exquisite medium. And uh, much like the appeal of canyon country in the Southwest, Yosemite systems are just dazzlingly beautiful because they're so monumental and clean. It's a very uh, unusual type of scenery in the world. And then again, they create these little lost worlds. You can go hiking in Yosemite, you're in a lost world, you're in a world of pines and granite and so on. And it's very appealing. When I came to visit Yosemite National Park, I was really at a time in my life where I was looking for change. And I thought that my change would be going to Southern California and experiencing the culture and the city. On my way, as I came through Yosemite National Park and really saw the beauty and the towering cliffs and the peacefulness and the smell of the woods, I realized that this is where I wanted to be. I realized that this power and this draw that I was feeling towards Yosemite was something I couldn't ignore. I found a way to actually come to Yosemite, to stay here and still have that balance and still have that peace. I'm a park ranger today because I came here and immediately fell in love with the place and knew that I couldn't leave this place. I may not have understood it at the time, but now that I'm here, I can't walk away from it and I'm, this is where I belong and this is one of the most amazing places on earth. Standing below a sequoia or a grove of sequoias gives an immense feeling of, uh, of smallness. 
and you realize the cares that you might have in the world, although significant, pale in comparison to the immense uh, giant uh, feeling of, of just standing below something that, that is that big and that immense. And uh, it's just quite staggering to, to realize um, your place in the scheme of things uh, at the base of a giant sequoia. The Sierras are deeply historic. The place where the discovery of gold fueled a nation to greatness and changed the nature of the American character. They are also home to modern rock climbing. This is Lumber Dome, and we're doing a climb called the Northwest Books. It's a short 5-6 because we just got here from the airport, so I'm just going to do something fun to warm up. Tomorrow we're going to go out into the Cathedral Range to Mathis Crest, which is like past that peak you can see in the distance, and it's like six miles in. So that should be fun. <laughs> it's like the bird place of modern climbing, so. Yeah. The High Sierras also contain many spectacular marble caves. And of course, the Sierras are the site of four of America's most spectacular parks. Devil's Post Pile National Monument, Kings Canyon National Park, Sequoia National Park, and of course, Yosemite National Park. The birthplace of America's wondrous national park system. This is Yosemite. Mike White calls himself a professional hiker of the Sierras and has written the definitive book on the subject. John Muir referred to the Sierra Nevada as the range of light. Spent a lot of time here coming up into the mountains and getting the mountains good tidings. And I think that really symbolizes what Yosemite means to a lot of people as well as to me in that it's, it's really kind of a spiritual homecoming. No one has captured the iconic beauty of Yosemite Sequoia, and the Greater High Sierras in word, better than John Muir, the father of America's national park system. No temple made with hands can compare with Yosemite. Every rock in its walls seems to glow with life. Awful and stern immovable majesty how softly these rocks are adorned, and how fine and reassuring the company they keep. Their feet among beautiful groves and meadows, their brows in the sky. A thousand flowers leaning confidingly against their feet, bathed in floods of water, floods of light, Of the Sierra's iconic meadows, he wrote, With inexpressible delight, you wade out into the grassy sun lake, feeling yourself contained on one of nature's most sacred chambers. Withdrawn from the sterner influences of the mountains, secure from all intrusion, secure from yourself, free in the universal beauty. And notwithstanding, the scene is so impressively spiritual, and you seem dissolved in it, yet everything about you is beating with warm, terrestrial human love, delightfully substantial and familiar.
hiking through the glorious granite domes of the Sierras, Mira saw their reverent beauty as a special prayer for everyone to treasure. Climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop away from you like the leaves of autumn. Mira held the ancient trees of Sequoia National Park with exceptional esteem. God has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and the thousand tempests and floods. But he cannot save them from fools. But there is also the subtle beauty of alpine flowers in the Sierra's glorious meadows. Waterfalls dropping thousands of feet from the high country to the valleys below create their own unique beauty. A powerful, ferocious beauty. The unstoppable fierceness of the waterfalls leads to the more subtle strength of turbulent rivers.
But there is a peace that also comes from contemplating the vast scale and sheer power of the Sierras. A scale and power built on its unique geology. The long and narrow Sierra Nevada mountain range extends over 400 miles and is only 40 to 80 miles wide. Many of its magnificent peaks exceed 12,000 feet. The mountains extend northwest from Tehachapi Pass near Bakersfield, California to just south of the volcanic mountain, Lassen Peak. The Sierra Nevada's eastern front rises sharply from the Great Basin, while its western slope descends gradually to the hills bordering the Central Valley of California. Geographical features that greatly impact visitors' experiences depending upon if they approach the Sierras from the east or west. The west side of the, of the Sierra, which most people, there's the first encounter is coming in from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area or from some Southern California. What they're going to experience is a gradual incline where you pass from the valley into the foothills, then up into the uh, mid-elevation forest, and finally when you start to get to the subalpine range near the crest, you get that uh, classic granite serrated peaks and glacial lakes and that sort of thing. When you come in from the east, or the backside of the park, it's, the rise is much more dramatic because of that fault uplift. So the, the roads, the trails, whichever way you come in, are going to climb much, much steeper and it's gonna be much more of a dramatic uh, incline as you come up to the Sierra Crest. Traversing north-south through the mountains is a very different story. Uh, the Sierra is fairly uniform uh, in its, its style and its motifs from the greater Yosemite area down to Sequoia and Kings Canyon. So it's gonna be very much, at least in the high country, the granite, the glacial lakes, the tall forests, the serrated peaks, the rushing streams and rivers. The Sierras were shaped by powerful tectonic forces. The well-known granite that makes up the core of the Sierras started to form hundreds of millions of years ago. At that time, where the Sierras are today, was the edge of the continent. Here, a mountain range of volcanoes and lava flows began to rise up. Underneath these volcanoes, a giant mass of magma cooled, forming the massive granitic Salinas block. Eventually, these early Sierras eroded away, and then this granitic block began rising up again around 20 million years ago. Kerry Cobb is a park ranger who has studied what happened next, beginning four million years ago. The current Sierra Nevada mountain range, it experienced a tilt, what we call a westward tilt. As the mountain range tilted, it created these gentle west slopes and these dramatic, amazing east ridges. So if you go to the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, you see these incredible drop-offs. But if you go to the west side of the mountain range, it's more of a flow and more of a gentle rolling. And that was created by this tilt. As the tilt happened, it increased the flow of streams and rivers that come through this area. And what that did is over millions of years, it carved out these deep valleys and these deep gorges. Of course, here in Yosemite National Park, the major river that flows through Yosemite Valley is called the Merced River. 
over time, that Merced River just exfoliated away the granite and created deep valleys approximately 2 million to 250,000 years ago. This, what we're sitting in now, Yosemite Valley, began to fill with ice and snow just piling up on top of each other until there were major glaciers in this area. We estimate that the glaciers here in Yosemite Valley were about 4,000 feet deep, which is where we get these 3,000 to 4,000 foot cliffs. Because of that tilt that happened millions of years prior, these glaciers were able to move from one end of what is now Yosemite National Park down to the lower elevations through Yosemite Valley. As that happened, these glaciers carved out the valley, then gives us that U shape that we see today. In addition, these granite peaks that you see were formed by those glaciers as well. Of course, the most obvious sign of these glaciers coming through is Half Dome. As that big glacier came through, it sheared off the face of Half Dome and gives us that iconic sheer face that we see today. What's pretty amazing about these glaciers is they take the granite and the stone from the surrounding cliffs and they carry them several miles down the canyon. And we actually see rocks several miles down the canyon that are attributed to Half Dome. On the eastern side is irrefutable evidence of the Sierra's volcanic origin. Here is a dome of obsidian, black volcanic glass. A little further west is another reminder of the Sierra's volcanic origins. This is sort of a little bit of evidence that, in fact, there are, there are still volcanic events in this area. Mammoth Mountain, which is just over these trees here, um, is a dormant volcano, but a volcano nonetheless. It's erupted, I think the last time was about 40,000 years ago. Um, there's still magma beneath our feet even today, and this soda spring is testament to that. This water is carbonated, it has carbon dioxide in it. Carbon dioxide released from that magma chamber is forced into the spring water that's coming up here at the surface. And so this water tastes just like, a, well, like a Sprite or some kind of soda water, but instead of a factory forcing the gases into the water, carbonating the water, the, the earth is doing that. The earth's pressure is forcing those gases into the water. Once the water reaches the surface here, the surface of the earth, atmospheric pressure is much less than the pressure deep beneath the surface of the earth, and those gases can escape. And those are the bubbles that we're seeing today. The Western Sierras are also rich in underground caves and caverns. Caves that are mostly solution caves dissolved from marble. Limestone that was metamorphized into marble by the tremendous heat and pressure of the formation and uplift of the Sierra Nevada batholith 50 to 10 million years ago. Here are a few of the iconic cave features found in Sequoia National Park's Crystal Cave. The Sierra's mountainous geography is the key factor in the distribution of their ecosystems.
The Sierras are populated by a variety of old growth forest and alpine meadow ecosystems. The Yosemite region is uh, you know, John Muir's stomping grounds. And he wrote some exquisite prose about the mountains of California, the Yosemite, and so on. And if you read these books, he's able to convey in very colorful and precise way what kind of amazing wilderness was there. But basically a series of pine forests that gradate down life zone, life zone, life zone, life zone. And these multiple life zones are represented in Yosemite because the valley is only about 3,000 feet and then the mountains behind it go up to 12, 13, and so on. So there's a huge vertical difference and set of life zones from the alpine down to the lower uh, digger pine and oak forests. So that region was home to basically the last grizzly bear in California was trapped in Yosemite. And it's on the flag. That, his name's Samson. And Grizzly Adams trapped that bear in Yosemite. But Yosemite had a huge uh, an expansive ecosystem of different species, many of which are now gone, but uh, luckily a lot of it's been preserved. The elevation here at Yosemite National Park spans many different life zones. The elevations range from about 2,000 feet up to 13,000 feet. At the 2,000 foot elevation along the Merced River, um, it will go up to Yosemite Valley, which is at 4,000 feet. Here at 4,000 feet, the, uh, basically we've got a lot of the ponderosa pines, we've got the black oaks, um, no giant sequoias at this elevation. There's a few that are planted here in Yosemite Valley, but this is about the four to 5,000 feet. The next life zone will be up at your five to 6,000 feet elevation, and this is going up towards Glacier Point, where you're gonna see more of your lodgepole pines and your uh, different uh, manzanita uh, grows at the higher elevations. And then we get up into the subalpine and the alpine ecosystems, and this is up in the Tuolumne Meadows area where you're getting into the seven, eight, nine thousand feet and up in Tuolumne Meadows, you've got a true alpine ecosystem where you've got not only the wildlife, you've got the, um, you've got the marmots, some of the large rodents and the bear and the deer that we have here, but the alpine ecosystem and then that will go up above the timber line at about 11,000 feet and go all the way up to 13,000 feet. So we have a good range of ecosystems. When you come to the Sierras, don't expect to see an abundance of wildlife like you might find in Yellowstone and Badlands National Parks. What you'll find is a smattering of birds, small mammals such as ground squirrels, including the ubiquitous chicory. a few lizards, mule deer herds in some of the meadows, and the occasional black bear. All of the bears that uh, people find here in Yosemite are black bears. And although they're called black bears, they range in color from a cinnamon brown to a medium brown, and I've seen them dark brown, almost black. We estimate we have between 350 and 400 black bears that live in Yosemite National Park. This is a good population. Um, they basically eat their natural food sources. They'll dig into logs for termites. Um, they will do some hunting. They'll eat a lot of plants. Um, we see the bears in and around the campgrounds. And what our goal is, is that there's enough natural food to sustain the bears. And so it's our goal that bears don't associate uh, people with food. And so we ask people to store their food properly. But the black bears here, the, the females weigh anywhere from 150 to about 200 pounds, about so big, and the males are larger. And they're, they're beautiful bears. And we feel that the population in the park is, is just about right for the food source and the habitat that we have. Fire and fire management have become an important element in maintaining the Sierra's native ecosystems. 
Fire is a tremendously important component of the ecosystem here in Yosemite and all forests. Forest fires are naturally occurring events. So in an area like this, about every seven to 10 years, there would be a lightning caused fire and it would burn. And in fact, the Native Americans, the American Indians that lived here burned the meadows and basically kept the natural cycle going. But what's happened over the past hundred years, not only here in Yosemite, but in other national parks across the country, fire's been suppressed. And this has created an unnatural growth of trees. It hasn't allowed new trees to come up. It's uh, created a huge, what we call a fuel load. So what happens is when a natural fire does occur, it's a catastrophic fire. So what we've tried to do is mimic the ecosystem. For example, here in Yosemite Valley, having prescribed burns where we'll burn areas or what's happening right now up near Glacier Point, we'll have um, what we call a managed fire. And that means we have a lightning caused fire, which is the one that occurred just a couple of weeks ago. If it burns, we have what we call the MMA, the maximum manageable area. We feel that if the fire doesn't threaten any structures, any trails, and it's a natural occurrence, will allow it to burn. So it's always that balancing act because it's putting some smoke in the valley and people come to Yosemite Valley and their views of Half Dome and Yosemite Falls are obscured. But once we're able to explain to them the importance of fire and how naturally occurring it is, people are very understanding of it. Right here at this spot in Yosemite, it is said that conservationist John Muir and President Teddy Roosevelt hatched the idea of America's great national park system. This is just a part of the pivotal role the Sierras have played in American history. The early human history of the High Sierra is shrouded in mystery. Archaeological evidence shows that Native Americans came to the mountains to gather obsidian to make tools, but probably never lived in the Sierras because of its harsh climate and steep topography. Early on, some of the earliest white settlers raised sheep in the area. But the event that transformed the region, as well as the nation, was the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in 1848 in the western foothills of the mountain range. On a bright, clear morning in January 1848, carpenter James Marshall reached into the cold waters of the American River and picked up an unusual looking piece of quartz. In the quartz, he saw gold. California park historian Ed Allen has studied how gold was formed in what is called the Sierra's mother load. The gold in California, the vast majority of it in the foothills of the Sierras is in one formation, and that's called the Mariposa Slate Formation. It is Jurassic in age, and it goes all the way from Sierra City all the way down to Mariposa. And what it is is slate, which is flat rock with veins of quartz through it and those contain the gold. When the news of the Sierra's gold reached the Eastern United States, tens of thousands of men left their families and jobs in a headlong rush for gold. A gold rush like the country had never seen before, nor since. People poured into the Sierras beginning a massive move west. The discovery initiated an entrepreneurial boom that energized the country, and the gold itself bankrolled America's industrialization. 
Soon stories of giant trees and magnificent valleys in the mountains made it to the east, reaching men like conservation pioneer John Muir. John Muir grew up in Wisconsin, and as a young man began walking the country. And as he did, a new idea rose in his mind. The idea that nature was not the enemy. Nature was not to be conquered. Some nature in wilds needed to be preserved. This idea reached fruition when he began exploring the Sierras. In Yosemite Valley in particular. He knew this grand wilderness needed to be preserved for all time. One of the pioneers here in Yosemite National Park is, of course, John Muir. John Muir came to Yosemite and he loved it here. He spent so much time exploring the different areas of the park and really letting people know why such an amazing place as Yosemite National Park should be set aside and shouldn't be disturbed and should be made available for future generations. John Muir is, is one of my favorite historical characters. And the more I learn about him, the more I'm amazed by this man. I, they, uh, they don't even know how many first ascents he did in the Sierra. I mean, he would just like pick out a peak on a given day and say, well, I'm gonna climb that. And more often than that, nobody had ever climbed it before. And I was reading recently about how he did a 7,000 foot hike to a summit in California, actually Shasta four times in an afternoon putting up barometers. I mean, he was a scientist, but I mean, he went up and down and he could climb that in, which would take a good hiker several hours or just, a, or five or six hours, he would do it in two, you know? And so not only was he an incredible mind, an incredible writer, but I mean, this guy was like one of the best hikers and mountaineers ever. If John Muir told the world about the value of Yosemite, Sequoia, and the High Sierras with eloquent words. Ansel Adams, America's premier photographer, showed its grandeur in pictures. Yosemite Valley, to me, is always a sunrise. A glitter of green and golden wonder in a vast edifice of stone and space. I know of no sculpture, painting, or music that exceeds the compelling spiritual command of the soaring shape of granite cliff and dome, of patina of light on rock and forest, and of the thunder and whispering of the falling, flowing waters. At first, the colossal aspect may dominate. Then we perceive and respond to the delicate and persuasive complex of nature. Ansel Adams, from the portfolios of Ansel Adams. Struggles over what would become of this magnificent wilderness would continue until the 20th century, until finally three parks and a national monument were set aside for all time. The rugged eastern precipice of the Sierras contains one of the most remote of the national monuments in the lower 48 states, Devil's Postpile. Here there is no fancy visitor's center. It is a monument that is only open six months of the year. Yet it contains something special, something worth the trip. Devil's Post Pile was set aside as a national monument by President William Howard Taft in 1911. One of the deep canyons here reveals a most unusual pattern. A geometric pattern. This is just a tease for what lies ahead. 
one of the truly geologic wonders of the world. One of the two great monoliths in this country. Devil's Postpile. Every angle on the monolith provides a stunning new view of this most unusual natural structure. Just as stunning as the walls is the very top of Devil's Post Pile. The top of the post pile is rounded off, dome-shaped, and the surface is actually polished by the glaciers, polished to where it shines in the afternoon sun. Another thing we see are the glacial striations. And of course, the most perfect six-sided hexagons you will ever see in nature. What makes Devil's Post Pile so unique um, is the interaction of fire and ice. Because Devil's Post Pile was originally lava, originally born of fire, cooled and hardened into rock, um, but it was buried. And it's the, it's the glaciers that have excavated the Devil's Post Pile that have revealed it to us. Um, so in fact, it's, it's the thousands of years of, of glacial working that has excavated the beautiful face of Devil's Post Pile that we see today. Um, another thing that's so unique about the Devil's Post Pile is the, the sheer number of six-sided columns. The hexagon being nature's most perfect shape, found in honeycombs and on turtle shells. Um, even pencils are six-sided because you can fit more of them in a box if they're six-sided. Um, and the Devil's Post Pile has 55% of the columns are six-sided, which is more than any other columnar basalt formation in the world. The Post Pile monolith is 60 to 80 feet tall. How far it extends into the earth is an unknown, truly making it one of the geologic wonders of America's West. One of nature's greatest living wonders can be found in Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Parks. Sequoia and Kings Canyon are very similar to Yosemite in their structure and composition. Um, but one thing that they do have that Yosemite has some of, but not in the, in the magnitude, is the giant sequoia groves. The giant sequoia tree, largest living organism on the planet. It's uh, the number one tourist site that people from Asia want to see. They want to see these trees because they're so immense. When they first started to cut the sequoias down and take them to some of the expositions, like in the famous Chicago World's Fair, people, they reassembled them and people didn't believe that such a, such a huge tree could exist. Home to the greatest concentration of giant sequoia groves in the world, Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks are managed as a single unit of the Park Service. However, their roads to park status were poles apart. By the mid-19th century, the story of a unique and dramatic canyon in the southern reaches of the Sierras began reaching settlers and miners in California. But it was not until John Muir visited Kings Canyon in 1873 that the canyon began receiving national attention. Muir immediately saw the canyon's similarity to Yosemite Valley. The discovery of this new valley further added to his argument that both were carved by massive glaciers during the last ice age, a theory that would eventually be proven correct. Kings Canyon's future was in doubt for nearly 50 years. Some wanted to build a dam at the western end of the valley, while others wanted to preserve it as a park. Interestingly, a part of present-day Kings Canyon National Park was originally set aside in 1890 as General Grant National Park to preserve the giant grove of sequoia trees growing there. At last, in 1940, 
General Grant was absorbed into the new and larger Kings Canyon National Park, which eventually grew to include the South Fork of the Kings River and almost 500,000 acres of stunning backcountry wilderness. Today, traveling into the mighty Kings Canyon is an adventure not taken by many people, but well worth the effort. Kings Canyon is one of the deepest gorges in North America, and to enter it, you feel like you're walking into a cathedral, and it just takes your breath away. And this beautiful canyon through which courses the South Fork of the Kings River, particularly when the river is full, you see the majesty of uh, water moving, the high walls of the canyon, and it's really a stunning sight to behold. It really gives you a, a feeling of your place in the universe, that something's going on that's much bigger than, uh, than we are. There is only one road leading into the canyon itself, a road that aptly ends at Road's End, deep into the east side of the canyon. Along the way, there are many scenic views of granite domes and craggy peaks. There is also Grizzly Falls, a roaring waterfall that lets you get up close and personal as it dramatically plunges some 75 feet in a crashing display of misty water power. A thunderous force so strong, you can feel the reverberations in your chest. But most people who come to Kings Canyon come to see General Grant Grove, a detached part of the park. This spectacular grove of giant sequoias covers a little over 154 acres. But it is here that visitors often get their first taste of the magnificence and scale of these trees, including the second largest living organism on the planet, a 2,000-year-old giant sequoia named General Grant. President Calvin Coolidge proclaimed it the nation's Christmas tree on April 28, 1926. And on March 29, 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower declared the tree a national shrine, a memorial to those who died in war. It is the only living object to be so declared. Giant sequoias are the sole living species in the genus Sequoia dendron, and one of three species of coniferous trees known as redwoods. It is a tree which occurs naturally only in groves on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada mountains. A single tree will grow to the average height of 270 feet and 25 feet in diameter. Record trees have been measured up to 300 feet in height and 56 feet in diameter. The age of these giants is breathtaking. When counting the rings on one of the logged giant sequoias, it turned out to be an incredible 3,500 years old. Sequoia bark is fibrous. The leaves are evergreen. For such a large tree, the cones are remarkably small. However, the greatest grove of sequoias is Giant Forest in Sequoia National Park. The first white man to visit these giant trees may have been Hale Tharp in 1858, who once lived here. 
Others followed. An extensive damage to the area was done by settlers who grazed sheep. Miners looking for gold. And lumbermen who cut down many of the largest sequoias. Finally, led by naturalist John Muir, a number of people began to make an effort to preserve the magnificent trees. A bill to turn it into a national park died in the Senate in 1882. However, the preservation effort was ultimately successful and Sequoia became the nation's second national park when it was established on September 26, 1890. The new park tripled in size one week after its founding, when the giant forest area was added. The groves of giant sequoias in Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks, and seeing these trees, I mean, it's something of a religious experience, you know, just a living thing that is that large. When people take pictures of these trees, it always, you know, you see people taking a snapshot, and they're beautiful snapshots, I'm sure, but unless there's a, a person in it, you can never get the scale. And even then, unless you're there in person, you really can't fathom it. And it's, I had a friend that said, you know, you, you've got to go look at these things, you know, to get small, and all your problems all of a sudden fade away because it just gets so small, you see, that the world is such a big place and that you're such a small, small part of it. Then there is the largest living thing on the planet. General Sherman is the largest of the giant sequoias. Uh, it's got a huge number of uh, cubic feet volume-wise, and it's a massive, massive tree that uh, will take your breath away when you stand below and, and gaze upon it. In addition to the giant sequoias, climbing Moro Brock is a must-do adventure in Sequoia National Park. I mean, one of my favorite views in Sequoia National Park, it's not a very long hike, it's less than a half mile each way, but it's, it's a heart pounder. I mean, you definitely get your uh, lungs burn a little bit because it's a staircase attached to Moro Rock and you hike up and you get this incredible view to the ends of the earth, it feels like. I mean, it's just the Great Western Divide is out on the horizon and uh, you see just the Sierra, uh, you know, just jump out in front of you as you hit this viewpoint on top of Morro Rock and uh, you really see to the ends of the earth is how it feels. It's, it's one of the most superlative views of the West. This solid piece of granite is just a tease for the domes and vistas that await the visitor at Yosemite National Park. Yosemite. The name says it all. There is no greater icon of America's western wilderness than Yosemite Valley. In 1851, Dr. Lafayette Bunnell accompanied a military campaign into Yosemite Valley. In the process, Bunnell gave the valley its name. Shortly after the expedition, Yosemite Guardian Galen Clark and California Senator John Connors advocated for protection of the area. A park bill was prepared and passed both houses of the U.S. Congress and was signed by President Abraham Lincoln on June 30th, 1864, creating Yosemite Park. This is the first case of land being set aside specifically for preservation and public use by action of the U.S. federal government. And it set a precedent for the 1872 creation of Yellowstone, the country's first national park. However, letting the state of California manage his precious Yosemite was not good enough for John Muir and his Sierra Club. 
In May 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt camped with Muir along the rim of Yosemite Valley for three days. On that trip, Muir convinced Roosevelt to take control of Yosemite and return it to the federal government. In 1906, Roosevelt signed a bill that did precisely that. When the National Park Service was formed in 1916, Yosemite was placed under its control. Today, visitors, whether they come from the east or the west, are funneled into a single one-way loop road leading into the valley. Reading them on the left is El Capitan. El Capitan, when you come into the valley, I mean, it just is this stunningly large piece of granite. I mean, it really is mind-boggling to see how the size, the sheer size of it, going from the valley floor over 2,000 feet up. I mean, it's a, it's a skyscraper of granite. Along with most of the other rock formations of Yosemite Valley, El Capitan was carved by glacial action. The monolith was named El Capitan by the troops when they explored the valley in 1851. El Capitan, as legend has it, was a rendering for chief, the local Native American name for the massive rock. Looking at the monolith, one can see that El Capitan has two main faces. Between the two faces juts a massive prow, a feature dubbed the nose by El Capitan's many rock climbing fanatics. Every angle, every change of light, Each change of perspective brings a stunning freshness to El Capitan, as if it were always being seen for the first time. Yosemite Valley itself is about eight miles long and up to a mile wide. Coursing through its center is the Merced River a river that ultimately drains the water that crashes into the valley from the high country. Crashes into the valley over four spectacular waterfalls. In the valley you've got uh, Bridal Veil Fall, I mean, as well as uh, Yosemite Fall, which is one of the tallest waterfalls in the world. It's the tallest in North America, and that's the centerpiece. Then you've got Bridal Veil Fall, right across the valley, which is an equally impressive waterfall. Then if you hike the Mist Trail to Vernal Fall, you can almost touch another incredible waterfall that's just, I mean, it's just an animal. It's just, I mean, it's so powerful in the springtime, These all these waterfalls are, that you can't believe how much water is going over those cliffs. And then you can hike another mile and get away from the crowds, which is what I like to recommend to people, and go to Nevada Fall past Vernal Fall and get get a little bit of elbow room and really get to enjoy it by yourself. They are ferocious beauties, I guess is the best way to put it. It's, they're so dangerous and so powerful, but uh, so beautiful. Moving along the valley, dazzling white granite peaks spring up on each side. On the right, cathedral spires. On the left, the three brothers and North Dome. Reaching the far eastern end of the Loop Road, the visitor looks up and there stands Half Dome, Yosemite's iconic rock formation. Half Dome, I mean, it's just this amazingly perfect formation. I mean, uh, so named, the name is pretty apt. Once again, I mean, just looking at it from above is a totally different experience looking at it on the floor. Each year, thousands of hikers reach the top of Half Dome by following an eight and a half mile trail 
from the valley floor to its crest. Then, a rigorous two-mile approach leads to the final pitch. A final pitch seen here from the air is ascended with the aid of a pair of braided steel cables mounted on posts. It is one of the most challenging and thrilling hikes in the world. For the less adventurous, there is another must hike. Scott Gediman is a Yosemite Park Ranger who never tires of hiking his favorite trail. If people are hiking and to go up, the quintessential experience is going up the Mist Trail to Vernal Fall. It's been a great year, waterfall year, but every year is a waterfall year. So to me, hiking up the Mist Trail, you've got the Merced River, you're hiking up, you're seeing some of the backcountry, you're going up to Vernal Fall, one of the few waterfalls that goes year round here. And that to me, I always tell people, it's about a three mile round trip hike, could easily be a half a day or a morning. And I feel that, I always tell people, if you're gonna do one hike in Yosemite, it's to go up Vernal Fall. Next to the trail, the Merced River crashes and churns its way to the valley floor. Off in the distance, you can spot Yosemite Falls. Along the way, playful chicory entertain the hikers. The mist, for which the trail is named, foreshadows the falls ahead. Then, as a reward for your one and a half mile hike, Vernal Falls itself. What remains is one last look at the valley from the road that winds up to Glacier Point. Here one has reached the high country, the road less traveled in Yosemite National Park. And for the visitor, the high country also means Tuolumne Meadows, a gentle dome-studded subalpine meadow in the eastern part of Yosemite. Tuolumne Meadows is this area in the eastern side of the park that's about, oh, it's about 4,000 feet above, uh, above the valley floor, which is about 4,000 feet above sea level. So once you climb up to the brink of the Yosemite Fall, you're in Tuolumne Meadows, essentially, which is uh, the high country. It's snowed in. I mean, it gets a lot more snow than the valley floor. It's, it's got similar features. It's all granite, but then it's got these perfect alpine lakes. Um, you've got a lot less people. You don't have the visitor services up there. Like the valley has four or five hotels, a lot of campgrounds. Up there you've got one lodge, some campgrounds, but a great many people aren't gonna drive up there to go, to go through the park and come out the east side. So you, you leave the people behind in large part. Uh, right now we find ourselves uh, in the midst of Tuolumne Meadows, which is the largest subalpine meadow in the Sierra Nevada range. It's a typical place most people who visit the park come to, either to enjoy the scenery or for the backcountry adventurers to set out on the trails as numerous trails radiate out from the meadows. The most famous of those hiking trails is the John Muir Trail. The John Muir Trail is from Yosemite National Park and goes all the way down through the Central Valley and to Sequoia National Park and is over 200 miles long. And a lot of people actually take that trek and relive areas where John Muir actually traveled himself to see these amazing places and this amazing landscape. Mike White has led many hikers along this celebrated trek through the High Sierras. Now we're on a piece of the famed John Muir Trail named after the equally famous naturalist. It's an over 200 mile long trail that connects Yosemite Valley to Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the continental United States. One thing about the Sierra, the weather is typically very fair, but 
You must be prepared when you go into the backcountry for any kind of experience weather-wise. You need to be prepared for snow, rain, lightning, high elevations, all those things that one associates with high mountain ranges, even in the typically sunny Sierra. Right here is one of the classic Yosemite signs, which is made out of uh, iron metal, and the letters are punched out. Usually what you'll see in many areas of uh, the West are wooden signs with carved numbers and letters. But these classic Yosemite signs are uh, definitely an icon in Yosemite National Park. We're walking down a typical section of uh, dirt trail in the midst of a lodgepole pine forest here on the JMT. We can look around us and we can see the tall, thin lodgepoles as they rise up to the deep blue Sierra sky. It's a classic tree in this uh, inner mountain area of Yosemite. And then on the forest floor, we look over here and see a couple of uh, mariposa lilies, which are a very delicate and beautiful flower uh, in the Sierra. And then further on up the trail, see a few more wildflowers, including these uh, lovely blue delphiniums. Here's some lupins, which is another very pretty common um, Sierra flower, and backdropped nicely by a large uh, glacial erratic boulder made of granite, which is the customary and typical rock of the Sierra Nevada. One thing about the Sierra Nevada is it's known for the granite that's been glaciated um, over the course of uh, geological epochs. And here's a fine example of one of those glacial boulders. Okay, one of the great things about hiking in the Sierra Nevada, and particularly in Yosemite, is you get some just incredible views. We can look behind us and see some of the peaks along the Sierra Crest, and then also look over this direction and see the iconic uh, profile of Cathedral Peak, named uh, because it uh, reminded Muir so much of being in a cathedral. I love to hike in the backcountry of uh, Yosemite and Kings Canyon and Sequoia, just for the serenity, the solitude, just the experience of being out in nature. And it's a wonderful thing that uh, everybody who's physically able ought to experience uh, in their lifetime, just to be able to commune with nature, to be able to get out and see some of these wonders that uh, are in our great national parks out in the West. However, there is one more thrill awaiting the everyday visitor to Yosemite, watching the rock climbers on El Capitan. Indeed, it was right here in Yosemite National Park that modern technical rock climbing got its start. So people often ask when the best time is to see climbers on the wall, and typically the best time to see climbers is in the fall and the spring, because that's when people climb the most because it's not as hot on the face of the wall. Um, people often ask how long it takes. The average to climb the wall is between three to seven days. And so people sleep on a cot on the face of the wall. Right here we're in the front of El Capitan, and uh, a climber was just climbing what we call the nose, where the two walls meet. And he got to the top of what we call the boot flake. And he placed a pendulum and he climbed back down and did what we call a swing across the nose so that way he can continue climbing up the nose. And now, one last look at Yosemite Valley. A memory for all time.